Hans, uh, welcome. Uh, I see you've joined. Hi, hi, hi. As, hi. Uh, as we were, we were going to kick off. I was going to do your intro, but now that we've kicked off with the deck, I'm just going to allow Kartikeya to finish uh, your few slides that you've prepared to kind of set the stage for both you. Uh, uh, you know as well enough, but and you have your views on India, but just to know the Bloom sort of point of view and for the audience to get a context on how our conversation is going to flow for the better part of Perfect. Next, the next one hour. That's great. Thanks a lot Thank again. Uh, let's go. Yes. Yeah. Awesome. Resharing my screen. Yeah, please. Okay, jumping straight in. So some of the key themes that, that you know, we like, touch upon very briefly. One is we're seeing new e-commerce models develop for tier two, tier three India, much more social in nature. We're seeing the growth of D2C brands. Uh, you know, very interestingly, media monetization is going beyond just ads, very exciting for the space. Uh, we're seeing the first significant wave of gaming creators and streamers, again, super exciting. Um, and you know, COVID has really accelerated the retail participation in capital markets and FinTech products are going niche. So these are some of the trends that we are seeing and I'll double click on some of them uh, very, very quickly. Let's come to e-commerce 2.0. You know, so we know that Flipkart and Amazon have really solved the e-commerce need problem for tier one consumers. However, you know, a large swath of this country is unable to participate in that e-commerce journey because uh, the experience is just not fitted for them. And so what we are seeing is new, what we call protocols emerging to uh, meet the e-commerce needs of this particular consumer. Uh, three predominant ones that we are excited by. One is reselling. You know, Misho obviously popularized this, but it basically uses a reseller, uh, a middleman essentially, or woman to sell products to their trusted community. The second is live streaming, where platforms are now allowing custom, uh, customers to interact directly with influencers and brands. And this is great for certain high touch categories like beauty and personal care, as you can imagine. And lastly, you know, we've seen the explosion of short form video apps in the country post the TikTok ban. And a lot of them are layering on commerce as a way to engage and monetize that consumer base. You know, there's a lot happening on the slide, but I think the one key takeaway from this that we'd like to leave you with is that we believe what live streaming is to China, reselling could be to India, right? It takes into account the dynamics of our country, particularly a large population with a lot of free time on one side, and then consumers who have, you know, a trust deficit, right? And so reselling allows you to bridge that gap, allows for lower CAC and really interesting ways to interact with the consumer. And we very interestingly are beginning to see this apply not only to commerce, but other categories as well. So for example, you know, Class Plus in our portfolio, an edtech company actually uses tuition teachers and classrooms uh, as a way to reach the end consumer and sell them stuff, right? We recently done a company in the FMCG distribution space that uses resellers to sell directly to Kirana stores. So I think you'll see more and more companies using reselling as an interesting way to reach the end consumer. DTC brands, uh, so, you know, this. Story is well documented, but basically today, DTC forms over one third of uh, e-tailing in the country. And what's really interesting is how fast they've managed to achieve this scale, right? So a lot of the companies, the great D2C companies you see today have been able to reach the 13 million or 100 crore uh, you know, revenue mark much, much faster than their offline peers. And we just expect, expect that to accelerate. Uh, some of the reasons for this are predominantly, you know, delivery infra today is in place, right? Express B, Delivery, Shadowfax, Dunzo in our portfolio have done a great job of putting that in place and brands are leveraging that, leveraging that to reach the end consumer at affordable prices. Uh, leveraging social media, you know, which has massive MAUs in the country to market and sell themselves digitally. Amazon and Flipkart using them to sell product. And finally, evolving consumer needs, which we think, you know, nimble and niche Challenger brands are much more uh, better suited to cater to. And so because of this, we think that the next decade will see many more D2C brands uh, be successful in India and as also globally. Media monetization. So, you know, like I said, we're seeing very interesting business models and monetization models emerge, which is very exciting for the sector. Uh, and the question always was, you know, will the Indian consumer pay for uh, content? And the answer, I think we, we can say resoundingly is yes, uh, because of what we're seeing, particularly for the right kind of content at the right price point. And what's really interesting is that, you know, some of these users paying for content are actually paying for something for the first time on the internet, right? So it's really helping bring people uh, onto online payments in a way. Uh, some quick examples, right? So personal wishes, announcements, uh, you know, subscription-based models, Cuckoo FM in the audio content app space. ShareChat actually made a million dollars through tipping uh, last quarter. And we have a company in our portfolio called Koo, which is a vernacular Twitter for India, uh, which is saw dramatic traction. And they're thinking of monetizing very interestingly, hopefully in the future as well. 
Uh, very quickly, game streaming. So, you know, we're seeing the first significant wave of gaming streamers and content creators in the country. Uh, you know, PUBG obviously had a, had a lot to do with this. Um, six of the top 10 live streamers in, on YouTube were actually from India, which even I didn't know and was very fascinating to hear. Uh, but we believe that this is a very interesting space and, and, you know, the global leader Twitch is not very well positioned to cater to this market in India. YouTube is current, you know, number one, uh, but we think there is a lot to do in the space, homegrown content, vernacular language, better local community features. Uh, and we're seeing a number of players uh, do really well in this space. And it's a, it's a space definitely to look forward to. Coming very quickly to fintech. Uh, so, like I said, you know, retail participation in the capital markets has exploded. Over 10.7 DMAT million DMAT accounts created during COVID, compared to just 5 million last year, and we expect this to accelerate. A lot of this has had to do with, you know, people have more free time. Uh, people have seen what's happening in the U.S. with Robinhood and other companies. Uh, but also, you know, platforms in India today have great UI, UX, zero the upstock, small case in our portfolio, really focusing on bringing a great consumer experience to the capital markets. Uh, and what's super exciting is that a lot of these new users are coming from outside tier one India. They are very young. 70% are actually first time, you know, traders and investors. So we expect this space to see a lot of action. And I think the companies that win will be those that can provide innovative product features, engaging social hooks, you know, user education and content, which will be a massive thing to focus on and great UI and UX. And lastly, you know, as we all know, India is a massive market, right? And each sub-segment of the country uh, can potentially lead to a very, very large business. And we are seeing exciting entrepreneurs and new, new companies focus on niches within fintech. Some of the ones that we're excited by are, you know, teenagers and Gen Z, you know, FamPay, Walrus, Slice in our portfolio, really focusing on the segment and building niche offerings for them. Women historically have been underpenetrated across all, uh, you know, major categories. And uh, fintech is no different. And we're seeing companies like Basis, LXECME, uh, you know, focus on them. Gig workers, as you can imagine, have very different needs from, you know, other consumers, you know, whether it's a, you know, easy credit line, you know, micro insurance or saving products or even upskilling and education, right? You can bundle that all in. And we've recently invested in Zol, which is on the cross-border, you know, a neo banking solution for migrants who moved abroad and face banking challenges. So, you know, we expect this trend to continue. And as the fintech ecosystem matures, we expect, you know, uh, companies to go even more niche. So that's a quick summary, you know, e-commerce 2.0, reselling, live streaming, content commerce, reducing fiction, uh, the growth of D2C brands, media monetization is moving beyond just ads, uh, game streaming and content is becoming a big space to look at, uh, you know, capital markets will be exciting. And lastly, fintech products uh, are going niche. So with that, uh, you know, if you'd like to reach me, talk about anything consumer, do reach out, ks at bloom.vc. I'll hand it back to uh, Karthik. Thanks. Thanks, Kes. I know I made you rush through that. I would. I wanted more time with Hans for the crowd. Yeah, yeah. Uh, um, Hans, uh, you know you're uh, very well known in the US, and I'm sure people have heard of you in India. But I, I still think I wanted to give uh, an introduction to uh, show your progress over the uh, the last two decades uh, in your career at venture capital. Uh, so Hans is, uh, you know, born in Taiwan, raised in the US. Stanford educated, uh, started with uh, Crimson Asia, moved to startups, Decima, Chiming, and now GGV. So very illustrious career over 20 years. And uh, not known for being in the Midas list eight times. Uh, and now, you know, he's refusing to get out of the top 10. <laughs> so I think he's finally found himself a nice, uh, nice seat to be here. And, uh, you know, 16 unicorns just by himself. Uh, GGV is quite an amazing fund, has managed to be one of the rare funds which has, you know, uh, moved from Asia, China, all the way to the US, and now clearly are showing uh, under Hans' leadership, along with Madhu and his team, uh, a, a keen interest in figuring out how India falls into that map. GGV has 60 plus unicorns, 35 plus IPOs since 2010. So uh, they don't need a bigger introduction, a more detailed introduction. But Hans has seen, you know, Slack, Peloton, Mituan, Affirm, Airbnb offer up uh, just an incredible diversity of, uh, you know, consumer companies which are each on the path of becoming legendary if they're already not there. Hans, I was trying to find one thing in common that I can say that I have with you. We're both bachelors in industrial engineering. So I got that one <laughs> somewhere. And I love the subject. I hope you did too. And it serves me well as a VC. But I wanted to start with a personal question. Like, A, how did this VC journey, uh, for me, it was kind of special how it played out. But I'd love to hear what kept you there, what keeps you motivated. And, you know, now 20 years in, what keeps that drive going? Because I, I hear you're one of the hardest working people. 
people in Silicon Valley. So I just love to know for the audience to know how, why does someone in the top 10 and in, on the Midas list, because that's what got you there, but what keeps you going further? Uh, th thank you. First of all, uh, extremely thankful and grateful for, for you to give me this opportunity to 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 share. Um, you guys have been amazing uh, partner for us uh, in India. Um, love your insights um, and your thoughts on how India would develop. So first of all, thank you, uh, your team. Um, secondly, um, I remember when I first joined Bessemer in 2004, 2005, I was looking at the um, Midas list because that's sort of list that uh, any young uh, aspiring VC look, look at. And yeah. they, they, everybody was based, pretty much 90% of the VCs were based in Silicon Valley, if not more. Um, and so they sit there and wonder how, how, how will the next uh, 10, 20 years uh, evolve uh, would ever uh, uh, make the list um, at some point in my career, even if it's number 100. Um, and I can surely say, given the experience I've had, uh, many of you will be on the list uh, for sure um, over the next five to 10 years because India is definitely rising. Um, and um, um, I had the fortune of seeing how, um, as a Taiwanese American, see how Asia developed leveraging Silicon Valley to grow. Um, the first 10, 15 years of my career, I saw PC uh, as a hardware rice, and then semiconductor, uh, IC chip, uh, IC fab rice, and then see the migration of manufacturing from Japan to Taiwan, Taiwan and Korea to China. All of that made it easier for us to see how China rise as a country of middle class. And that allows the basis for consumption to happen in the second 15 years of my career. So as you can see, I see things in patterns as a historian, uh, sometimes five, 10, 15 years at a time. And there's no question in my mind that uh, we're seeing a lot of factors that are making us bullish on the rise of India, both as a market, but also as a country of founders that can eventually build very global businesses. Thanks, thanks Hans. Um, and uh, thanks for taking this uh, you know, uh, time out for us. I also wanted to congratulate you on your new fund, uh, another two and a half billion dollars. I know you were a little over $6 billion before that. How do you, how do you folks think about allocation to this kind of diversity of geographic markets. Uh, how much? Yeah. How much should India expect? I know there are no rules usually, but what what, what should one expect from uh, GGV in India? Yeah, um, uh, the, for GGV, uh, it started in two thousand, and it actually started in Silicon Valley in Singapore. The four four co-founders of uh, of GGV, three were based in, in the U.S. One was Canadian, one is American of Egyptian descent. Um, the third is um, uh, of, of Jewish uh, ancestry. Um, all, all three of them um, met each other in Silicon Valley. Uh, so it's the perfect example of America, achieving the American dream. And then um, uh, the fourth co-founder comes from uh, Singapore with affinity for uh, Asia and, and China's rise. And the forum got together and um, raised a billion dollars for, for the first 10 years of GGV. Mm -hmm. And then under the the leadership of Jishuin, uh, Jenny, and uh, myself and others, um, the second 10 years of GGV, we raised 8 billion. Um, we really benefit from the rise of mobile internet, uh, specifically in China and the U US. Um, and since um, since we started becoming more, more global, um, we started looking at markets in Latin and uh, India uh, and Southeast Asia, going back to our roots, because we're seeing some of the similar things, patterns emerging from China and from US to these other, other markets. And um, for anything outside of the US and China, we're increasingly allocating more money. And this is why we continue to raise a bigger fund so that we can keep the number, number amount of investment in US China uh, relatively the same or slight increase with additional going to Southeast Asia um, and India, where we're bullish on the next uh, 10 years. Very useful. And then uh, talking specifically about India, you've gotten off to a hot start, Udan, Vedantu, Turtle Mint, I'm glad we have a co-investment already and hopefully we'll build on that. Rupik, Kata Book, uh, very different stages. I mean, you know, you came into Series D in Udan, uh, uh, 12, and Series A in Kata Book. Of course, the, the size of the fund allows you that diversity. I understand that. But how does Hans Stung look at, you know, your decision-making lens on why it's so important to get in at Series E when you can, yep. A, when you can get in at Series yep. B? That's what it's going to say. These are lessons that I learned from uh, the last uh, 10, 20 years. I remember 
within the first uh, three months at Bessemer, I presented an investment roadmap and I showcased a number of companies that were publicly traded from China in the US and Hong Kong back in 2005. And Tencent was what a three billion dollar market cap, um, and Baidu was at uh, five billion dollar market cap, and uh, Baidu just released uh, in Hong Kong uh, earlier this week. Um, the market cap is over um, you know 50, 60 billion, um, and you look at uh, Tencent and valuation is over seven hundred billion. So even had we bought stock uh, in Tencent and Baidu at that time and did nothing else, I, I, I would have made more money for. Uh, Bessemer that invest in Series A bets in China uh, in 2005. So okay. if you step back and see um, how would this ecosystem thrive, and if it thrives, what are the companies and sectors that, that will take off and have a much bigger return? That that's where we should be focusing our time on. So as a such, we are more thesis and sector driven rather than stage uh, uh, driven. Got it. And I know you started off predominantly in the consumer lens, and that's where most of, a lot of your track record has been built. But you've also yep. started looking at India from the enterprise tech SaaS lens, or rather, you have invested in them in the US, but we haven't yep. seen that uh, got, get yep. it started in India. Any reasons, yep. or are you just waiting for the perfect you know, the SaaS deal? Or what, are, yep. what are plans on the enterprise side? The, the short answer is that we, we're interested in five categories, uh, sectors in India. That's uh, B2B2C, uh, or SMB tech. That's uh, FinTech. That's ad tech, uh, as in SaaS that can um, go, go global and over time uh, B2C as well. So these are all the, um, which includes uh, EdTech. Uh, so these are all the categories we, we look at because we think those are the growth drivers for India as an economy and uh, as, a, as a country. So still very sort of tops down, what are the factors? And um, on the B2B front, um, in, in a country where GDP capital is still on the lower end of where it could be, um, focusing on B2B gives us a chance to aggregate demand and aggregate supply and allow the founders to generate uh, more scale in a shorter period of time in a country that's still developing. And what we, we know that in, in China, manufacturing was a huge piece to drive uh, GDP per capita over time. So we wanna see more manufacturing uh, happening in, in, in India and investments we make are geared towards helping that to be uh, possible and have an amplification effect by more manufacturing, more production, more distribution to have more goods circulate within the economy to generate more economic benefits for more broader audience. So that's why we're much more keen on companies that can go into tier two, tier three cities. Um, KS had, had a slide on more companies monetizing and expanding in tier two. That's exactly what we think as well. That's the lesson we learned from looking at China uh, uh, similarly. So the, because of that, uh, we're just sort of moving in uh, sort of phases. And uh, we definitely are keen on helping Indian SaaS companies both expand within India, but more importantly, also go global. So we just signed a term sheet on a, on a company that does that. And it's not close yet, so we can't announce it, but there will be sure. more coming. Sure. Well, it's great to hear. Great to on both fronts. And, uh, you know, a lot of, uh, lot of us at pre-Series A, uh, where we invest in, or seed stage, essentially betting on the promise that the founders and the team is solving a really deep problem. And it's a lot of the time bet on a very big market opportunity, very good team, but a lot of that's not determined until the first six months, 12 months, 18 months flow. And then what we have struggled a bit with is, uh, maybe it's the depth of the, or age of the ecosystem. Uh, when you see uh, engagement or a behavior change in consumer, especially in the consumer space, if, if there is no benchmark, if it's not, your uniquely looks like a Chinese behavior or an American behavior. We find new markets find it difficult to go all in, right? Yeah. And uh, I'm using that as to, you know, uh, preface a question on uh, how do you think about uh, growth versus uh, engagement versus monetization, growth versus profitability when you're looking yeah. at early stage? Because I think what the American ecosystem has developed incredibly well over the last uh, two, three decades is the ability to have a pulse on hey, there's a big behavior shift coming and it doesn't yep. matter when monetization happens, we go in straight uh, yep. and we go in really early. And, it is, yep. and I know you play Tata book, but I'd love to understand your thinking for early stage, yep. both founders and investors in the audience. Yeah. Yep. Um, I know from uh, when I was in China, um, China went through that process as well. The first 10 years of China venture investing was looking at everything in Silicon Valley. Is there a benchmark so we can okay. compare? 
And then the second 10 years, things changed because there are things happening that you, you, even U.S. didn't have it. Uh, for example, live streaming, uh, uh, social commerce, or reseller social commerce. All, all that happened in China first, and there was no benchmark. By that time, uh, there were enough exits and enough maturity in the ecosystem. People can have a sense and feel that, you know, I've seen first, second wave happen already. And we made money. Therefore, I'm more bullish on betting what makes sense for this country, the society, rather than looking for a global benchmark. So I think over time, India will shift um, and evolve as well. No, no question about it. And in, in, uh, in China, we do see um, VCs investing in companies that monetization may not be there, but the usage and the frequency of usage and engagement level are super, super high. And, though, 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 um, and there are enough successes that people have confidence monetization will come. Um, it's, in, in the US, for sure, that's something that's more of an established practice. Um, now, of course, this, uh, with every generation, there's some people who overspend and eventually don't go well. And those are good lessons for every generation. And that will still happen yeah. no matter what. But in, yeah. that, in the greater context, you still see more and more companies learning how to focus on user engagement, user um, sort of excitement, users frequency of usage first. And what we always feel that investing in companies that have the highest frequency of usage allow them to expand into categories with lower frequency of usage over time. And that, that, that kind of mentality is extremely important to build a super, super app. And, and Catapult fell, fell in that category for you? Catapult and the product iterates uh, quickly and it doesn't spend all the money on marketing. It's more product-led, uh, more organic growth. And that, that's kind of the, 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 uh, the innovations and approach we like, and we can be patient on monetization. Got it, very useful. And, and I know you spoke about China and, and you know, for the last five, six years, a um, lot of funds and uh, strategics from China definitely were looking at what is going to be a very obvious replication of the China playbook from uh, 15, 20 years ago. And uh, as the, the, the market was evolving very rapidly, I think we were trying to imitate playbooks which were even two, three years old. And I don't know whether it was a good thing or a bad thing, but how much uh, at your level, uh, if not GGB at a personal level, how much of your bets in India are kind of influenced by uh, what you see in China? And then are they, as a corollary to that, are there sector trends here that really excite you because either they map to something else in the world or absolutely new? I know you've spoken to this, but I wanted maybe more specific examples of what really sure. excited you. Yeah. For example, um, Rupee and Turtleman are good examples. Um, yeah. We didn't find any sort of uh, benchmark anywhere in the world for Rupee and Um, But you can see in a country where there's a lot of storage, uh, a lot of gold, um, it, it should be more efficient usage of that uh, to get more loans, uh, short-term loans to Got speed it. up and, and generate more efficiency in the ecosystem. And so uh, it was very easy for us to like uh, Rupee, even if it doesn't look like M Financial. Uh, but we went through the process of the Alibaba and Financial to see why M Financial and, and Alipay are different than PayPal. Uh, it's a completely different innovation. It's more of an escort service and it serves something for society that no other, uh, uh, other country at that time in the world uh, had that. And so that's what we saw in Rupee. With Tournament, it was also the same thing. In a country where you start with insurance for your uh, two wheelers um, and, and the bank's insurance company needs more help, you can see both with B2C and B2B model emerging. That's quite interesting. And with the B2B model, it can be uh, regional uh, beyond just India uh, uh, today. So they, they, these are not things that we have seen elsewhere, but you can tell that it's doing what's right for the society and also leveraging India's competitive advantage to build a regional business that over time could be global. Super. Um, very encouraging to hear that you're thinking, sitting in Silicon Valley, you're thinking about you know, how different brand new models can emerge out of a market like India. Uh, and it's a true mirror to our face to see why we are doing that even more than before. But I can assure you to the point you made, it's a huge difference from say four or five years ago. So four or five years ago, uh, I actually tweeted uh, once that, that nobody was paying attention to what Danzo was doing as a model because we thought yeah. it was changing, you know, building customer love at a scale uh, that nobody else was able to. Yeah. But no one was paying attention to it because they were worrying about Hey, will it monetize? Is there a benchmark somewhere else in the world? Yeah. And then that became a mental block for a lot of investors. So, yeah. uh, and, and it's, it's amazing that you've already surpassed that in your head. So, great to hear that. 
Um, this, um, I had some generic questions, but I wanted to double click on uh, some of the points we made on consumption and consumer behavior and trying to maybe understand it from your experience in China, right? Uh, do you agree with this thesis that we still a, are a market where the top 50 to 100 million people in India look like a higher GDP economy on a per capita basis, whereas the rest of the country uh, is more of a needs economy and, and not able to keep up with their aspirations and wants because consumption power is lesser. And is that leading to, uh, that leads to two questions in my mind, and I, I want to hear your thoughts on that. Therefore, is there a dramatic uh, B2B to C uh, sort of bullishness in your head? Because you feel like, you know, you're actually enabling the earning power by playing yep. the B2B2C model. And unless yep. you create spending uh, spending power, there is no earning. I mean, you create yep. earning power, there's no spending power, rather. Yep. And so uh, is that what's driving your B2B2C? And where is, which other areas do you see in India that can be super exciting around that? Like we have class plus in our in our, in our portfolio, which does that for yep. educators, as example. And then yep. on the, the flip side of that is, therefore, do you also think we need to be serving the global markets more? And you know, companies like Urban Company and Zomato have tried going overseas. Uh, and and do you see that to be a trend line, uh, and not just wait for Peloton or Airbnb to come and take over uh, yep. global opportunities? But who do you think that will get built out of India? Yeah. Um, when I first talked about uh, Chinese company Google Global in 2014, 15, a lot of people laughed. I mean, what are you talking about? Um, and uh, uh, so for the last six months, I've been talk saying that. Indian companies will go global and the speed at which they go global will be faster than the Chinese companies. Um, and not a lot of people responded because it's just not something that people think about. Um, yeah. And that's totally fine. Um, <laughs> and with, with a country of 2 million science graduates every year, uh, and more and more than getting into tech and by tech, I actually mean internet tech, not just software outsourcing tech. Um, the the tr training exposure um, over the next five years will be incredible. Um, and more companies will try to go abroad from India. Some will work, some won't, that's okay. Because the more iteration they are, people learn from it. When I look at ByteDance, um, Yiming, uh, this is his uh, first startup. And um, if he didn't have the prior two times to learn from that, um, um, there's no way he would have been able to build uh, ByteDance. And so I don't think of what people are doing today or tomorrow, it is really in terms of iterations. Um, and um, on your point about um, uh, B2C companies from India, yes, it's, it's much harder to build a huge business that's monetizable in, with only India alone today. It will change over time. But in the, in the meantime, if the, if the business has a chance to expand beyond India, they should take advantage of nothing else just to learn and see. And it's okay if every step is not measured in absolute optimized efficiency. You got to have different tentacles and try different things and see which path or which route give you the best outcome. And that, that we learn from watching DeepMind playing against uh, um, the you know, top three uh, go, to, go player in the world in 2015. Yeah. You got to be yeah. able to try different things. The, the thing is, you got to try it and then change quickly. And if you're in that spirit of doing that, eventually you, you find the best answer um, that will win, win, the, win the war, not just the battle. Um, when I look at um, B2C, um, B2B2C, I definitely feel that China benefited, China internet benefited, not because of the rise of smartphone. It benefited because the 20 years prior to that, so many manufacturing moved from Korea, from, from Taiwan, from Singapore into China, and then um, more manufacturing from Europe and uh, US moved to China. Without that, there's no base to build a consumption class. And we're seeing that happen similarly in India uh, today, and that's the exciting part. And you see the SaaS companies from India going abroad, more and more executives they're talking to on the other side of the table in Silicon Valley are from India originally. It makes it easier to have a conversation to win the trust. And that's what we saw with Chinese manufacturer earning uh, orders from a Taiwanese uh, OEM, ODM, or, or Singaporean player, and, and so forth. So the same thing could be happening in India on the SaaS side. So maybe a lot of people in Silicon Valley don't think about that today, but I guarantee you in 10 years, it will be extremely different. Freshworks is a great example, and more of them will be coming. Great insights. No, great insights. Thanks for that. Before, uh, just a short pause uh, to ask the audience to start posting questions. Um, I know we have a tight schedule and we want to end this on the hour. Uh, and so if you can post your questions in the Q&A board, I'll try and get to them as soon as I'm done with uh, my set. I just wanted to switch gears a little bit and, and uh, 
talk more about the ecosystem or uh, fun questions directly uh, to get Hans's opinions on uh, India versus uh, other versus the other ecosystems that we've seen. So maybe the lead question on that, Hans, is uh, any criticisms or complaints with the startup and tech ecosystem in India? What could we be doing better? What would you have loved to see uh, happen better, move faster, uh, from more, not from a critical perspective necessarily, but from constructive criticism so that you would love to see us do what better that we get to the 2025 mark and beat your aspirations of, for us? Yeah, but it's not, I don't, I don't view this question as a complaint or criticism at all. Um, the Indian market has rapidly evolving. I remember when I wrote my first personal check into uh, Snapchat in 2012, 2013, it was a uh, very different market uh, then. And today is much more um, uh, up to the step, uh, practice the standard of Silicon Valley uh, than ever. And uh, we'd love to see, uh, Mado and I were just sharing this notes uh, last week. We'd love to see more standardization of, of terms, uh, like how MBCA uh, in the US has templates. And so every round the VC can just look at a template and make modification uh, to it as needed. And the founders can see what are the terms that other people uh, treat as more market practice. Um, and that will help to uh, minimize the amount of negotiation amongst the lawyers on uh, uh, every single term because there's more of a standard out there. Um, and I think that is going to come uh, very soon because there's just so much practice and and uh, deals have done and um, already in India. Sajid, uh, uh, just a heads up, uh, I, I would love for you to get to the Q&A, and so I hope you're curating them at the back end. I wanted to pull you in for the Q&A. Uh, in the okay. meantime, uh, some more questions on that thread, uh, Hans. Um, clearly, you voted with a, a deep wallet and put in deep checks into folks like Sujit and Fudan, et cetera. But you know, when you benchmark uh, Indian founders in your portfolio versus their peers in SEA in Southeast Asia, China, US, uh, Again, what is that to learn? What are the learnings for us from a, a Peloton founder or an Airbnb founder? Uh, and I know the ecosystems are not the same. Uh, what's the goods that good good aspects of what you've seen from decades of working with these guys that we could do better on from a founder level, not necessarily from an yeah. ecosystem level? I think f from a, at a founder level, we, we do see the it, it's a, it's amazing to see the, the hunger and smarts and the drive of the Indian teams for sure. It's world class. Um, meeting so many companies over the last uh, few years, and from investing in Snapchat, um, uh, Snapdeal, and looking at Snapdeal, how Snap Snapdeal has grown through the ups and downs and up again. It just seeing all that. It just the resilience um, is in the intelligence and the amount of learning that gets accumulated is incredible. I, I would encourage Indian founders not to. Always, uh, it's good to look at what's happening outside and for benchmarking, for learning. At the same time, um, develop inherent principles that you, you want to follow. Um, I remember talking to Lei Jing back in 2010 when he wanted to do uh, Xiaomi. Xiaomi, uh, yeah. Was second, yeah, second VC he called. And you can tell, I mean, he has learned so much from his 17, 18 years at Kingsoft already. By the time he wanted yeah. to do um, Xiaomi, all he yeah. focused on is how do I make sure that the customers really, really, really love me? And that's the same philosophy that Airbnb Brian Chesky had. How do you make you know a hundred, a thousand people love me instead of a million people like me? And that relentless drive to have people turn from customers into fans, not just for efficiency sake, not just for high retention, but really love what you're doing. That that is the single most important thing that founders can focus on to guarantee success. Monetization, growth, all that will come afterwards and later. If there, you can find people who really, really, really love you, and that word of mouth effect is just incredible. No, I agree. I mean, I've seen it in a few of our companies, and nothing to replace that. Everything else kind of flows and follows through. Very rarely yes. do you see a company that's gotten that right and and not actually managed to convince and get believers on the financial markets to be able to grow and survive, build a great yeah. company. Um, uh, just a, a theoretical question, but to humor us, if if you could start a company today. Or if you were incubating it with uh, Madhu or someone else, what, what, where would it be in terms of geography? What's and what sector? What, what, what would you like to build? Uh, I mean, I, I'm sure as VCs we all have those pangs. We think, hey, I, I would want to build that idea. Yeah. I know we we can't leave our addiction of working with founders, but if you were right. to do that, what would it be? Well, f first of all, I know I'm I'm, uh, I'm not as good a founder as I would be a VC. 
So I'll be the first to admit uh, I've had temptations over the years and I just know yeah. what, I'm, what I'm good at, what I'm not good at. Um, yeah. But if I were uh, uh, going to uh, incubate or be part of a startup, definitely go was ass from India to the rest of the world will be something that I will be very keen to start, uh, especially in industry sectors that um, India already has a competitive advantage in, um, uh, in pharma, in healthcare and so forth. Um, and it is it is um, the amount of resource that's available and you build a company that in, uh, your customers like engineers will come uh, they all want to join something sexy that's impactful that's world changing um, and so that, that, that there's no brainer that that's the kind of company I would want to incubate or uh, be a part of yeah it's just, uh, super encouraging for uh, the SaaS crowd though this was supposed to be a consumer panel but uh, I, I know uh, that that you have as I said, back to in some incredible consumer and B2B to see companies. So you are a believer, and I, I but uh, that's a great answer. Um, and I think the SaaS founders will love that answer because that's, I think, what they're all aspiring to do. And we, you know, we have, a, there's some great ones, Madhu and me keep talking about them as well. Yeah. Um, on, on this, uh, on new trends, I mean, uh, maybe a few uh, pointers that you think uh, are, Fads versus long-term sustainable ideas. What did COVID throw out, which look like fads, uh, and you know things that are obviously are taking off in uh, in this era where everybody's bottled up and people are you know uh, in a very different mental state, right? I won't call people nuts, but I'm just saying we're all in very different mental states, and we're we're perceiving new ideas, new problems, but they may not exist if if we go back to a normal. Uh, we can't, any of us can't predict that to perfection, but when do we, when we get back there, what's actually sustainable long-term shifts in consumer behavior that you're yes. sensing? Even if it's from the American context, it would be fascinating yeah. for us to hear. Uh, versus what is just a fad and might go away? If you have any, yeah. again, I'm not that focused on the fads. I want to know what's sustainable long-term behavior. Yeah. Uh, the, the, thankfully, I think there are a lot more uh, consumer trends that are sustainable than, than being fads. Um, uh, there's no question that we're seeing a lot in communication enterprise collaboration that is that's happening in a huge way and increasingly more and more enterprise companies are looking like consumer companies zoom's a perfect example uh zoom i'll beat everyone else because it's so easy even uh, everyone's grandma can use it one click you start um maybe you talk about zoom fatigue you can talk about usage will go down when COVID 19 is over but there's no question that become a way we communicate and that's impacting a lot of collaboration tools within the enterprise um, and between enterprises uh, and across different departments as well. And you, we also uh, see that you know in ad tech, in fintech, in uh, telemedicine, uh, e-commerce, um, all of that, there's just consumption pattern it just has changed uh, dramatically. In the U.S., because offline world works quite reasonably uh, well, the the need for mobile internet, the need for um, uh, doing things on, on your smartphone is a lot less. But during the last 12, uh, 15 months, everything changed. Um, and, um, and then uh, looking at a, the area of, of fitness, uh, physical fitness and mental health, lots of things happening. We're, we're mm. fortunate to be an investor mm. in, in Peloton and see how Peloton, even at IPO or close IPO, a lot of people at CNBC were poo pooing it, uh, cost, uh, incurred too much losses in their growth. But during COVID 19, everything shifted. So there's more of that happening. And I think once people get used to the convenience of ordering uh, and trying things on mobile internet and, and on smartphone, it, it is a habit that's hard to shake off. Mm -hmm. and, and what about, um, I launch into a question, I think that's already on the board, but uh, we also plan to ask you that. And then Sajid can help me uh, with uh, all the Q and A that's come your way. Uh, but this whole trend of, you know, uh, is this a fad? I mean, if not, uh, the, the trends you picked are obviously deep. They're deep needs, uh, and the human condition is going to uh, seek them to solve it more from a need perspective. And then there's always this, you know, sort of more more of a whimsical need, right? And buying digital assets for sixty nine million dollars, right? Yep. Um, and um, you know, sneakers or you know, uh, media of a certain kind. And, and are those fads, uh, is, there, is there going to be asset value to things that are born out? And are, are we not able to relate to it as a different generation? And yeah. is there a generational shift which then drives a very, very different consumption yeah. uh, in, in, in the future? 
So yep. starting with NFT, uh, anything, any views on that? Yeah, great, great uh, question. Um, we were fortunate to wrote, uh, to have written a small check uh, into Coinbase at about billion dollar valuation. And, and we thought just more of a hedge because this is something that could be quite interesting. That's just getting ball first. And we have no idea that it will be as big as it is today. And we thought to, to get to the valuation it is today, it has to be people you start using in everyday life. But right now, still just storage of value. Um, when you look at uh, the, the tensions globally and the um, uh, and also the impact of COVID nineteen, more governments are printing money, more money than ever. So if you have this uh, depreciation of, uh, of, uh, of of capital of money, then it's, it's, it, it, it drives a lot of demand to store value inside uh, bitcoins and other uh, NFTs. So that, that's something that's a fundamental, huge, uh, massive sort of capital allocation trend that none of us kind of expected uh, four or five years ago. Um, and as you know, I'm investing in StockX and StockX will end up doing something interesting uh, uh, start thinking about this category as well, because everyone needs to. Um, so there's going to be more interesting activities going on um, and there are going to be more exchanges and there are going to be more brokers. Uh, uh, involved in this uh, in this growth on a global basis for sure. And is it a, is it a, is it a top of the cycle excess liquidity phenomena, or do you think uh, uh, do you think this is actually sustainable even after the world settles down into a regular economic cycle? If there yeah. is something uh, like it, that, it, if the political it. political tension continue to rise and society experience more uh, tensions in general, even beyond COVID nineteen, whether it is uh, regardless of its nature. Uh, then uh, more volatility drives demand for NFTs. Um, so this could be, and then with, with the um, millennial um, becoming more active as consumers, this this is this is a very uh, obvious trend now. Um, you look at um, success of Roblox. It's not just people uh, playing games. It's people Correct. on top creating. of that uh, yeah. creating games. And you yeah. see previous pl uh, players become game developers on the same platform. This is a continuation of, of that as well. So just over to you. I, I know there's some questions I would have asked some of them, but uh, let, if you can attribute it to which guests asked them. So just of course, uh, Hans uh, uh, leads a lot of our thesis in education, uh, media, agri. So uh, spars with uh, Madhu as well, and uh, he's the one who came up with uh, the idea of uh, branding ourselves as Indus Valley as opposed to Silicon Valley. And and uh, his newsletters, I don't know if they make them to you. Uh, we actually write them for our investors. But I'm happy yep. to share them with you from next quarter. Uh, that would be quite great. fascinating. Yeah. So uh, over to you, Sajid. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. Thanks. So I'll get to the question straight away. Uh, there's an interesting question uh, from Veer, uh, and uh, Veer's question has to do with the number of uh, the supply and demand. Uh, what do you think about the ratio of high quality startups in India versus the capital that's available, and is that really driving the the serious uptick in valuations that we're seeing in India as well. Uh, how do you kind of see this? Yeah, I think that there's no question since uh, 2016 with uh, GST and UPI and the rise of GEO uh, made India very different. Um, and it, be, before people were making comparison between India and China, it's not a fair comparison because you don't have a if you don't have a lot of uh, users who can get online at a very cheap rates. Um, in, the, in the rising uh, GDP per capita, it's hard. No matter what 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 what, what work you do, you're not going to be able to monetize or grow uh, very efficiently. Um, and I think because of all these uh, fundamental shifts and changes in India, and more Indian companies, whether it's in on SaaS or consumer side, can um, build a more um, regional, if not global, business over time. There's definitely a rush of capital to India, and for short term, you will see valuation being extremely volatile. You will be frothy. And there will be correction, and it happen maybe happen a few times. Um, but if you look again for a five, 10, 15 year time period, um, if you have uh, the patience to weather through those uh, those um, um, periods of volatility, there's no question that um, there will be great venture returns possible in in India. So for for us, sharing our own example, we know for the first ten years of G uh, GDP, we missed many things. Um, and we learn from those mistakes and learn from those lessons. We, we debate internally whether we should expand our fund size, uh, AUM or not. Um, we debated whether we should stick to a certain stages um, or become more stage agnostic. 
Um, and we debated what we should have geographic uh, expansion, which should focus on what we know best. And um, what you see in CV today is a culmination of a lot of discussion and changes that happen internally. And I, I foresee a boom and others, the, the best VC firms in India will go through that too, um, because it, you have to adapt to the environment. We all are very fortunate because of uh, growth in particular countries or the rise of particular paradigm. So it's not less about us as individuals. There's more we're part of a, a, a greater force at work. So if you are tuned to the to the what's possible and what are the forces that's in favor of greater growth and, and do what's best for that to help the nation develop, um, then everything else kind of fall into place. So we worry less about a particular deal, a particular term, because you know, Xiaomi and everyone was super expensive. But if Lei Jun and team well, can ride the way and do a great job executing, then everyone, everyone look back and say, oh, that, that was a great deal to, to enter, enter Xiaomi. So we can debate about the, the risk rewards at every point, but at the end of the day, it's riding the right wave and, and backing the right founder and helping them be, be successful and make you know, big companies uh, happen um, at, at the end of the day. Because when that happens, everything else is secondary. Is Eerie House similar? This is to what a lot of people say. If you think that this could be really big, don't worry about the entry price as much. Uh, so that's a great point. So this is a, so another question uh, from Sujay, one of my colleagues. Uh, so it's a great question. Enhance experience. What's the one thing that you do as a board member, which has the most outsized impact on the portfolio company? So what's the one thing that you do consistently that has an outsized impact? I think um, the, the one, if it's only one thing um, that I, I look at myself as the impact I make is to figure out how to do things in a few different steps uh, ahead. Um, I have a sense of what it takes for something to be massive um, that has been uh, trained over a period of time with different iterations. So um, even in point of uncertainty, um, I don't worry about it too much. Um, I advise company to be more efficient and, and, and self-reliant and all that, but also figuring out what's the next thing that we could be doing to um, help the efforts of nation building and help ourselves in the process. Because if you align yourself with doing what's good for the country, for the society, it's hard not to build something massive. And uh, for different webinars and master classes I've given, I always use the example of Alibaba launching Taobao during, a, uh, during its COVID-19 SARS back in 2003. And it, it happened when everybody had to be stuck at home, um, but the, the culture that Alibaba built and Taobao that was launched, 95% um, of market cap of Alibaba today came during SARS and thereafter. Even though the company was already four years old, uh, five years old at that time, but 95% of market cap today got invented during and after um, SARS. And that's something a lot of people um, don't, don't know or did not uh, think about. Um, so um, having that uh, lens not to sweat about the, 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 the challenges today, which are important, had to be uh, tackled, but keep an eye on, always keep an eye and the other eye on the future is what I like to do with uh, our founders. Fantastic, great question. Uh, so there's another question, which is, uh, um, this is to do with the perennial, uh, Thing about exits in India, uh, because slew of IPOs coming, of course. But uh, this Harsh Gulati uh, from RPSG Ventures, uh, what's Hans's take on exits in the Indian ecosystem? How does GGV think about that from an Indian context? Is that something that's even on your mind? Uh, you know? Yeah. So, yeah. We, we, we do have discussion with uh, we species we work with and founders whether companies should list in India or ideally list uh, uh, outside, for example, NASDAQ. Um, and I think for each industry, uh, it is uh, definitely different. So it's something that we definitely think about. In India, you can get higher valuation, uh, higher revenue multiple potentially. That's what we saw in China as well. Uh, but there are more regulations and maybe less liquidity. Uh, that's changing for sure. Um, and, but it's, we look at it on a case-by-case -case basis. Uh, we, I also think that th there will be uh, a lot of Indian companies that over time, if registered domicile in Singapore and elsewhere, um, can list and do well on NASDAQ as well. So um, I think both pack and work, it, it depends on the situation. Got it. Interesting. Yeah. So we have uh, time for a few more questions. Karthik, if you, uh, so I'll just 
Happy point. Radhika Agarwal asks, uh, incredible feat to see 16 unicorns from a single GP. What are the one, two traits, either something they did or some inherent personality trait you've seen across most of these founders? Is there, uh, you know, so. Uh, I, I think I'll, all these founders are smarter than me, for sure. That's a common trait. <laughs> 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 and uh, you, 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 you see them have a very good sense of, uh, of the founder market fit or founder product fit. Uh, that's one exa two examples I love to use. Brian Chesky um, for Airbnb, you can just tell that he really, really cares about um, his uh, uh, customers, consumers, their experience. And he's very much want to figure out how to make them uh, just can't stop talking about Airbnb. And you look at um, someone uh, like John Foley at Peloton. I mean, he just, he knows what, what, what he's trying to do. He has a very clear vision of how his um, product um, is, is going to uh, change user experience uh, in, 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 in a way that just not seems fathomable before. Um, he takes that uh, cycling experience from a, you know, premium studios in premium cities and make that democratize that access. So um, Airbnb figured out to take away these extra inventory of homes and democratize access for an amazing user experience between the host and the guests. So figuring out ways to democratize access is a common thing that these founders believe in from their bones. And they, they figure out ways to make that what they're, what they're doing, even as a premium product, much more affordable. I remember first thing looking at Peloton, people say, why, How, you know, each bike sells for $2,000. How many people can buy it around the world? How can it ever be nothing but a niche business? And, <laughs> and then uh, John partners with uh, Max Lefchin, another company we invested um, with a firm, so you can buy now, pay later. So 39 monthly installments um, of about $97. And if you have two people um, living, even, even in, a, in an apartment, sharing, uh, sh uh, sharing that, and $97 for two, a month for two people, that's the cost of gym membership for, for those two people. And yet they can use Peloton much more frequently and it's a much better experience with the best instructors in the world. And it's so fun and it's competitive as a leaderboard to gamify it. All of that is so much worth than spending money on gym that you may not even go to um, most of the time. So if you do the math, there's a, there's a kernel of truth to make this powerful and you're waiting for the right time for more consumers to see that value and shift and COVID-19 can accelerate in that. So I don't need to be able to predict COVID-19 to see Jump Peloton would be successful, but it definitely benefited that in short-term acceleration period. So as a VC or as a founder, is do the right things. You don't know what will happen to speed up the adoption, but if you're moving towards the right direction and you have a kernel of truth that makes sense mathematically, over time, users will be delighted to know and find that. Your, your job is educate them and uh, make it accessible for them, make more people have a chance to experience it. And, and, and don't depend just on yourself, work with partners to build an ecosystem. That's one thing I learned both in Silicon Valley as well as in China, is how to build an ecosystem so you have partners that work with you to be successful together. Because if you can do that, then the whole ecosystem becomes hugely massive. Yeah. Some great, great lessons, Hans. So I know uh, we're running uh, to the end. Hans, can we borrow three or four extra minutes? Sure. Uh, so I'm, I'm, uh, Sajid, if you don't mind, I'll take it over and try to run it like a rapid fire. Uh, maybe one line of answers, Hans, I know they're difficult, but any views on uh, the EV ecosystem in India? Do you think charging uh, e-mobility will kind of take off incredibly or is it still time to know that answer? Uh, it's, it's early, but I think uh, the global market uh, will have a place for uh, India EVs for sure. Crypto, uh, given what you've seen in Coinbase, do you think the, the, we're, we're at step one or two or five or nine in a, a step 10 journey? We're, we're still early. There will be quite frothy evaluations, but some of them will emerge to become greater players. If an uh, Indian founder is trying to crack a B2C business in the US, any tips at all for them? Any way to think about that opportunity? Um, come, come talk to us. We'll help you to figure out who to recruit. Okay, so I'm going to get this founder. He's one of ours, Shachin. I'm trying to go and get him a, a, a chat with Madhu and borrow 30 minutes from him, for sure. Okay. And uh, this, we get a lot, by the way. I, 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 I take pride in mentoring a lot of folks who have started funds in the last five, six years in India. We were seen as kind of mini pioneers in the early part of the decade. But now yes. there are 50, 60 of us, as you know, in India, small funds. Yep. 
And there's almost one in two of them as I had a chat with us. So how do you find a co-founder for a fund? <laughs> I think that's two, three times tougher than, than a co-founder for a company. Uh, but I, I completely agree. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> that, 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 that is not uh, easy. I, I, ideally, you want to be able to co-invest with that individual uh, in at least one or two companies and see how they deal with problems. Uh, the best way to get to know someone is always in the face of adversity. Super, no, super answer. And uh, your biggest, um, the entire portfolio question is boring. There's an interesting question from Manit Jain. Your biggest investment failure and what did you learn from it? Oh, um, my biggest investment failure is definitely making a bull bet in a new geography. Um, in, in, uh, in this case, it was in Latin. And so, uh, just a lot of things didn't, did not go right. Uh, if any one or two things had done differently, maybe the outcome would be different. Sometimes the hardest thing is trying to figure out how to help founders when they're not ready to be helped. Uh, but it is what it is. And the last one, uh, the consumerization of the enterprise. Actually, Tony, by the way, from Agora was our guest two nights ago. So <laughs> all in the family. Uh, we didn't realize yep. it was a portfolio, I think, when we asked you. But uh, you know, would love to hear how pricing models, key metrics, and B2B getting consumerized too uh, is, is changing your view of uh, SaaS in, 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 uh, com compared to conventional uh, large enterprise B2B. Yeah. Uh, well, Agora is a perfect example. Um, Tony was a, a CTO of YY, startup was sold to YY, um, and uh, he had done an amazing job making YY much more robust as a platform. And in 2012, 2013, he decided to strike, strike out on his own to build a startup. For the first three, four years, he was trying to figure out what's the right part of market fit. And when um, live streaming uh, started to take off, um, video demand for video is so important for video compression and encryption. That's where his technology really, really, really shined. And so uh, being have the sense that videos will be massive over time and just have a persistence to keep on going at it um, that his technology and products speak for themselves um, has gone a long way when market started to take off. It's it, there's definitely a parallel to the Palo story with with COVID-19 as well. And so um, for anyone out there building something uh, similar, um, it, it is extremely, extremely important to have the faith that your direction is right um, and then keep on building, iterating until the market take, can take off to take you along with it. Thanks a lot, Hans. Uh, thanks for the extra three minutes. This was incredible amount of content and knowledge and wisdom from 20 years packaged into one hour. Uh, we, we, will, uh, we do record these sessions uh, every year at Bloom Day so that others uh, in the ecosystem can benefit from listening to these as well, not just the 100 odd people who signed in today. Uh, as you may know, as from my request, this was a 10th anniversary edition of Bloom Day. Uh, so a lot of the lessons that you spoke about, uh, we feel like we're at the midpoint of that 20 year journey. So look forward to doing a lot, lot more with uh, GGV and you over the next 10 years and uh, seeing an incredible success story get crafted out of India uh, over the next decade. Thanks once again. Thank well, you. Th thank you, Sanjay and uh, KS and Sanjay and everyone. You guys have been fantastic. Thank you. Thanks. Bye. Thank you. Good Have a good weekend. Ta -ta.